All right, we are back. This is lecture eight of CS164, and believe it or not, we only have a few lectures left. So today we focus on iOS and closing some holes and also introducing unit testing, which I promise, boring as testing sounds, um, it's one of those life skills that uh, definitely do as I say and not as I've done for years, because this is a very good habit to get into. But more on that in a bit. Um, next week, we'll focus on matters of scalability. Um, which can be generalized not just to the iOS world, but back to the web world and such. So especially those of you who are interested in do, working for startups, doing something entrepreneurial where you yourself are going to have to figure out how many servers do I need, how do I connect them together, how many databases do I need so that you can make the next greatest thing, or even something more limited in scope. We'll talk about those issues in scaling out your own architecture when a course like this or CS50 or any other no longer just hands you the architecture you need and a username and password, but you have to figure all that stuff out for yourself. Um, in a couple weeks time, we'll be joined by a friend of ours, Edward Guar uh, Edwin Guarin from Microsoft, who will talk about Windows Mobile development, as well as how you can make web-based apps appear to be native, thanks to libraries like something called PhoneGap. And then the last lecture, We'll come full circle and look at uh, issues of security, both related to mobile devices, native apps, web apps, and try to plug in some holes so that you can scramble and fill in any, uh, fix any mistakes that might be in your fourth and final project. So today, um, I finally finished reading through all of the mid-semester survey feedback and just wanted to cherry pick a few of the common themes. I um, realized that there were other topics that arose, um, and so this is not meant to diminish those, but really just to focus on some of the recurring ones. Um, so turnaround times for getting PSET feedback. Um, the head TFs and I have spoken with the team, and we will aim to turn things around even more quickly than we have thus far. Um, and do reach out to me or heads at CS164 personally if you're feeling like you're kind of in the dark as to where you stand as to uh, what you can be doing better in these projects. Um, in terms of partners, so this is a problem that was inevitable. So we talked to CS161, for instance, before the semester started as to how their historical partnerings work. Um, and Margot Seltzer, who's taught that course for many years, gave me the lowdown on statistics as to the failure rate of partnerships, not failing grades, but failed partnerships. Um, and so we kind of anticipated that we'd have you know, 10 or fewer a partner, dramatic situations, a falling out, one of them drops, one of them withdraws. So the numbers have been pretty consistent with that. But this is really just to acknowledge that these things happen. Um, the course is deliberately designed to have people working with partners, because the reality is you can do more interesting things, certainly on a larger scale that way. But these kinds of fallouts are inevitable. So do reach out to us if you haven't already, if you're having some last minute drama or whatnot, so that at least you end the semester on the highest note possible. Um, I know partners can kind of make and break courses. CX CS161 for me was amazing um, because I had a great friend um, with whom I was working on that uh, in all of its projects. So I realized kind of can leave a sour taste if your roommate, if your uh, partner is not pulling his or her own weight. So we'll try to accommodate um, if need be in the weeks that remain. So support. So a curious comment throughout some of the surveys was that there's not enough support in the class. And while I absolutely concurred with that a few weeks back, um, now we do have the cyclical office hours and design uh, reviews and code reviews, as well as weekly sections that are filmed, as well as walkthroughs now for the staff assigned projects. And so I can only respond in a couple of ways. One is be sure, obviously, you're availing yourself of these resources. And if you can't make it logistically that you watch the videos online or that you schedule something with us more intimately one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for those of you who just came out of 50, though, I can say that um, the course does not have the sort of nurturing environment of weekly intimate sections of just 10 or 15 people. And that's deliberately designed. Um, so if that's what was meant by support structure, that I do concede. But it's not the design of a higher level course like this. But do reach out if you're feeling that even with these new mechanisms in place, that you're not quite um, being able to succeed in the class. So also comfort levels. Um, and this, too, I think created some of the um, issues that we tried to address earlier in the semester and, frankly, some of the ones that remain. So we have a huge gap of experience levels in this course, far more than we have even something like 50, because whereas there you just have kids coming out of high school, here we have college students who are still sophomores or seniors who have interned, maybe, in the latter bucket for one or two summers. And so the just gap between less and more comfortable folks is just much wider. So in retrospect, to be honest, 
you know, I think we probably would have ratcheted up the prereqs for the course and not just had 50 be the only prerequisite and maybe expect two or three courses in computer science. Um, that's certainly too late in coming now. But just realize we're aware of this. It's the first time the course is offered. That's something we might do if the course is offered again. Um, so for now, realize we've tried to bolster the resources we have to handle the 150 disparate backgrounds that we actually have. Um, and finally, time frames. Um, this one, too, I kind of want to offer a bit of tough love. So I also concede, and early on in the semester, things were a little tight. But now that there is at least a weekend for every one of the milestones, and given that each of the projects has month-long time frames effectively, I really do need to push back to some extent to say that if you're really scrambling up until the last minute to finish these things, it's really a time management issue, as much as it is high expectations for these projects. And I can only plead for this, second, uh, for this first iOS project. If you're not planning to set aside a non-trivial amount of time this week, do, 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 do. Realize that most of you had some kind of web programming background earlier, but this is a very new world. It adds OOP back with a completely new language. There's a whole number of features you have to implement. You have to work with your partner. So realize this is not the sort of thing you're going to want to dive back into on you know, Saturday or Sunday, like use this week effectively. All right, um, please reach out if you have other questions or concerns. So let's uh, round out one detail here to talk about how you can actually store data persistently. So especially for the Student's Choice project, you have the ability not to make ephemeral apps that boot up, do something, and then that's it. But you can actually save state, not unlike Evil Hangman's uh, high scores or really any game or application that actually remembers data even after the phone is turned off, rebooted, and the app itself is terminated. So you can store data in an iOS app in a whole bunch of ways. Just to recap, a property list is one of the easiest ones. You're using it for project two. What is a property list, really? Yeah. It's just an XML file. It's sort of an abstraction layer on top of what underneath the hood is just an XML file. But what, can you, what kinds of uh, collections can you store in, an X, in a plist? Yeah, arrays and associative arrays called dictionaries in the context of Objective-C. So this is nice. And what kinds of things might you typically want to store in a property list in an iOS app? Yeah, exactly. So settings, right? So the user settings. In fact, NS user default is an abstraction layer on top of a storage mechanism that allows you to store things like what's the default length of words for Evil Hangman, how many guesses do you get, so that the user doesn't have to pick these all the time. Um, also, besides just user defaults or user preferences, what about when you first ship Evil Hangman and a user downloads it from the App Store and they just don't have, by definition, any preferences yet? Well, where might you store the truly default value for word length? or number of uh, guesses to give the user. Well, you could hard code these in constants or sharp define in your code. But if you want that, those things to be much more easily updatable so you don't have to recompile the code and all of that, well, you could even store your default defaults, so to speak, in a property list. And there is a mechanism with NS user defaults to pre-populate it with these out-of-the-box defaults that the user can then override by actually changing those settings. So in short, it's very nice. It's relatively simple. You can debug it easily because you can literally open the thing with a text editor if you want and see what's actually inside. So what about SQLite? We've talked about SQL in probably some prior class that you've taken. SQLite is all about what? Yeah. Perfect. So it literally is a light version of a SQL database, whereby the database is just a big binary file that grows as you add tables and rows to those tables. But it still gives you the expressive capabilities of SQL. So you can do selects and inserts and deletes and joins and the like, but without the overhead of actually having to talk to a server. This is compelling in a mobile device, because you don't really have like MySQL or something running on this thing. And you don't want to probably require internet access just to talk to some remote database server. And even then, it would not be a good thing to execute raw SQL queries over an internet connection, unless everything's nicely encrypted and such. So in short, you can still use SQL, and you can still model your data and your entities and relationships and all of that, but with a smaller, uh, a lighter weight implementation of that same thing. Um, so there's XML and JSON. So realize that especially in the context of web programming or in iOS apps that talk to the network, like an instant messaging client or some game application that's multiplayer, you can talk to remote servers using mechanisms that you might remember 
transfer from web programming, whether it's XML or JSON. And thankfully, Apple finally added to the iOS 5 SDK native support for these kinds of things. So it's actually a lot easier now to parse XML and JSON without having to Google around and find some nice person's、uh, open source library to add to your project. So the SDK is getting better at that. And core data, which one or more of you have actually asked about or commented about on the help board. Um, realizes an abstraction layer on top of any number of mechanisms that allows you to have a storage container for storing data persistently, but you yourself don't really have to care about whether it's SQLite or just an XML file or the like. Its complexity is、um, it's more complex to implement than, say, something like. Uh, NS user defaults for actually storing data. But if you actually have complex relationships among objects, student objects, and courses objects, and faculty objects, and the like, something like Harvard courses, core data allows you to abstract away the details of SQL and get out of the business of deciding your actual schema with as much precision and let the operating system actually manage objects for you. What does this mean? This means instead of writing a SQL query to select data,、uh, data from a database, you instead would call an Objective C method that Itself figures out how to get all of the course objects from the underlying database, whether it's SQLite or something else. So, in short, you don't need to use this for Project 2. For Project 3, you're welcome to use Core Data, and checking a box in the templates in Xcode allows you to enable Core Data relatively easily, but we would defer to any number of online references for actually wrapping your mind around the capabilities.、Um, and realize it's, again, just an abstraction layer that allows you long term to simplify the management of more complex. Data sets. So let's take a quick look at SQLite, if only because SQL is probably among the most familiar mechanisms here,、um, XML aside, and take a look at this example here. So in this SQLite project, PDF and source code's online if you want to play along. We have pretty much the same application that we played with last week that allows you to create a little interface like. This in the simulator, where I had a whole bunch of words, in this case,、uh, excerpted from the project itself. And I just wanted to have a little bit of a table view. And today the projector is a bit cleaner. You can actually see the rows in this、uh, UI table view. Well, let's see where this data is coming from and how you can use SQLite, not just to do something simple like this, but something a little more interesting. So here are my files. This is just a single view application template. So I kept it pretty simple. And most of these files, like main.m, I can pretty much ignore, though. Notice I do have small.sqlite. So I actually created this SQLite database offline using actually a little PHP script. Long story short, I wrote a little PHP script to open the XML file. Then I created a SQLite database using some PHP functionality. Now, this is not necessarily the norm. You can create an empty SQLite with an Xcode itself, no PHP, no XML. But I just wanted to convert essentially our small.plist file to a SQLite variant so I could include it in the project. So I just dragged it over into my supporting files. So let's take a quick look at the app delegates. Because that's where the story often begins after main.m. Nothing interesting here. This is just template code, view controller, and window. Let's look at appdelegate.m. All right, this too looks pretty vanilla up top. But if we start to zoom out here, we see application did finish launching with options. Nothing going on there. So now let's look at view controller.h. Really nothing going on there. View controller.nib, well, this appears to be a list of cities, but really, again, this is just Xcode's depiction of what is a generic table view.、Um, so, lastly, view controller.m. So, let's see what's inside of here. So, notice a couple of things. I seem to have included this header file so that I can actually invoke various SQLite methods, some of which might look familiar if you've used this in some other language.、Um, let's come back to this in just a little bit. Uh, and down here, synthesize words. What is that? Well, words is apparently referring to this property. I'm not sure why it's in my m file instead of .h, so we'll come back to that in a moment. But here's the synthesize for it. And here's the guts of this program in it with nib name bundle. So when is this method called? And by whom? By the app delegate. So recall that the app get delegate has that application did, la did finish launching with options. And among the things it does is this line here. This is just boilerplate from the template. So you get this for free. And recall that the thing it's calling is view controller alloc and then calling on that object in it with nib name, view controller. So the app delegate. Creates a view controller object and then effectively loads into it the contents of the nib file so that, nib, so that the view controller has a view that it can present to the user. So, this method we're overriding. Why? So, 
So now I'm back in viewcontroller.m. Why am I implementing this method, which feels like it's some system level initialization method? All right, step back. What does it mean to override a method? A little sanity check. Carl. Yeah. Perfect. OK, perfect. So in the context of object-oriented programming, where you typically have a hierarchy of objects, and we do in this case, the class is called viewcontroller, but what's the parent class? Well, let's check the .h file. It descends from UI view controller. So Apple wrote that thing, UI view controller. Inside of that class, they implemented a whole bunch of methods, among which is in it with nib name bundle. So if I want to override that method's default behavior in order to do my own app specific initializations of the state of my world, I still need to call that method so that it does its usual thing, but as soon as it's done in calling, then I can go ahead and do what I consider to be initializing my application. So right here, I've copied the signature of that method. And notice that in the very first line of code, what am I doing? Well, I'm actually calling the parent class's version of this method and passing in literally the same arguments, nib name or nil, nib bundle or nil, that I myself was passed as arguments. So in other words, I ask my parent, do whatever you need to do with this, these arguments. And then I proceed inside of this if block to do what I actually want to do. Now, unfortunately, SQLite isn't the prettiest type of code to write. What language do you see in here, or languages? SQL? Yes, well, OK, so SQL, good. <laughs> what else? Objective C, good, and? C, right? So this is where things get a little messy in that the SQLite library that ships with iOS is actually still C-based, which means back our pointers and ampersands and all of this more so than we see in Objective C. So let us see what's going on here. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was not intentional. I had to say that word. All right. So first we have some mutable array. So what are we going to do here? Ultimately, my goal is to create an NS mutable array that's empty by default. Then I want to load from my SQL database that I dragged and dropped into this project when I created it at home. And I want to do a select on that database, get each of those strings, and put it into this array. So that's the big picture. So here's how I create an NS mutable array, allocating it and then initializing it. Here I have a pointer to what appears to be some kind of SQLite 3 structure. So that's probably a struct declared in what file, probably the .h file that I imported up above. So now here, what's probably the point of this line? NS string path, NS bundle, main bundle, path of resource, dot, dot, dot. So the whole chunk of code is going to, as the comment says, connect to SQLite database. But what is this second line of those three actually doing for me? In the file. Yeah, it's, sorry? It's setting the file. It's setting the file, yeah. So specifically, it's figuring out the path of the file. So if you're a PC user, this is asking the question, is it C colon backslash program files backslash whatever? It's answering that question. Or in this case, it's probably going to be something like slash documents slash something. And specifically, the file I want is small dot p list. So this just gives me a path, a string. Question? Confusion? Oh, yes, thank you. Small.sqlite, exactly. So that's the correct extension. So what does this do? You can infer from the function name, SQLite3 open, open some kind of connection to that database. It's not a network connection. It's simply a, it's like f open in C, if you recall how to open a local file on disk. So how do I now talk to that connection? Well, I need to have a, a query. So I'm going to go ahead and create an NS string here that's literally SQL code, a SQL query, very simple one at that. Now I'm going to have a, SQL th a SQLite3 string statement structure, or rather a pointer there too. And then I'm going to go ahead and call SQLite3 prepare version 2, so very well named here, um, passing in a pointer to the database connection, so which is a pointer to some structure, then passing in this cryptic thing. Well, what is this doing? So this is taking the SQL NS string object declared two lines earlier, and returning it as a UTF-8 string. So UTF-8 is sort of a fancier version of ASCII that can actually support far more characters than we would typically have on an American keyboard. So you can have Asian, language, uh, Asian characters and other characters with accents and so forth in there. So this function just expects a UTF-8 string. So that ensures that what might be ASCII that I typed is actually UTF-8. Um, ampersand statement is actually passing in it's actually not passing a pointer, per se. What's it actually passing in? 
We didn't spend much time in 50 talking about these. So statement is a pointer. So what's ampersand statement? So not value. That would be star. With the address of so point it's a double pointer a pointer to a pointer the address of a pointer now why in the world would you ever want to pass in not just a pointer but the address of a pointer recall that a pointer is just 64 bits in this case and it's a memory location why would I care where in memory that 64 bits is yeah Exactly. Exactly. So in this case, we want to actually change what the pointer itself is pointing at. And to do that, we have to go to its storage location in RAM, change those 64 bits so that the pointer is effectively pointing at some newly allocated structure, or in this case, some kind of statement. So this is a way in C again of you could also return the address of a statement object or a statement struct. But if you want to effectively return multiple values in C, you can pass in things by pointer and actually mutate their values, not unlike what we've done in those examples like swapping two values, passing them by reference. All right, and so ultimately, what does this thing do? It prepares the notion of a statement. A statement is something that you can then um, execute uh, by stepping over it as follows. So while SQLite 3 step, passing in that statement, equals equals SQLite row. So in this case, SQLite row is some sentinel value that means here you got back a row. I can then go ahead and get column number zero from this statement and store the result in a char star called C, then I can convert that char star to an NS string using this syntax, which we haven't had to do before. And though the story sounds complicated, it's mostly just um, copy paste of typical code when you want to go from NS strings to C strings. And then self.words add object S. And just in, uh, intuitively, why did I have to convert the char star to an actual NS string? in order to execute line three there. Exactly. Char star is not an object. It's literally just a pointer. But the collection classes in Objective-C, namely NS mutable string, NS dictionary, and the like, these expect pointers to actual objects, where an object is a descendant of what class? NS object. So that's what's expected here. So we just have to jump through some hoops. So in short, this is a god awful mess, frankly. So this is why there exists like abstraction layers like them core data, so that you don't have to deal with this kind of crap, frankly, when writing code. This is a little too low level and messy when really we're just trying to express ourselves in terms of getting data back from a storage device. But it's doable and it is supported um, in iOS. Yeah. That would uh, NS, oh, so the second line here? Yeah, NS string star. Uh, yep, that is exactly the same, except what you just described, string with format, is what we'd call a convenience method, um, but it achieves exactly the same result here. Yeah, Zach. There, what's the difference between you putting all this in init with nib name instead of the view did load? Ah, good question. Why put this stuff in init with nib name as opposed to view did load? Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah. If you read loads, you don't have to. Exactly. So if you evict the view from memory, which frankly will not happen in this app because there is only one view. Well, actually, I take that back. It could happen if we background the app or I get a phone call in the midst of it or a text message. So the view to save memory could be punted from RAM. And so the implication, as Yella has said there, is that if then I then foreground the application again, or I hang up the phone call and I go back to playing this application, well, the view is going to have to be reloaded, which means I'm going to unnecessarily ask the database for those five or six words again and just do a lot of work unnecessarily. Now, with that said, it's not hard work to do. It's going to be super fast. And so if you are actually are developing a fairly large application and you really do want to conserve as many bytes as possible so that the iOS operating system doesn't say, forget this, you're using way too many megabytes of RAM. I'm just going to terminate you altogether, which is bad for apps and business. Well, then you could say, fine, I'm just going to spend CPU cycles to reload this data later so as to save on memory. So it's just that trade off that we always saw in, in 50. Good question. Other questions about SQLite? All right, so I'll wave my hand at the remainder of the code, since it's quite like what we saw last week for actually rendering a table view. But recall that a table view, 
this list of strings in the UI. It pretty much boils down to having a data source and a delegate so that the application can send messages to your class to which you need to respond with answers. For instance, you will be asked, how many rows does your data set have? You need to be able to answer that question. And that's what the functions down there do, methods down there do, just like last week. It's pretty much identical. Any questions? All right, so we've promised for a couple weeks now to peel back the layers of memory management, which have admittedly gotten easier with iOS 5. But unfortunately, a lot of the documentation you see online, a lot of the header files that still ship with iOS, a lot of textbooks or just online tutorials still make ample reference to some of the crossed out keywords here, namely release and retain and such. So we started telling the story last week. When you allocate an object, like an NS string or a student object with alloc, what happens in terms of this concept known as reference counting? In other words, how does memory management work in iOS or in languages like Objective-C? Yeah, so you effectively get not so much back, but inside of the object is stored the secret number 1, which means there is one valid need for this object to remain in memory. So just like in C, you still have the notion of a stack, you still have the notion of a heap, and so when you call alloc, you're grabbing a few bytes from the heap, but ideally, you don't want to use those bytes in perpetuity because eventually you'll run out of space, right? The heap tends to grow down, at least as far as we typically depict it, so stack is going up, 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 heap is going down, down, down. So if you never actually free memory, as by calling free in C, or by calling formally release, in Objective-C, heap grows down, 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 stack might grow up, 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 and eventually these two might collide or you're just going to use more RAM than is available to you. So freeing up your memory is typically a good thing. So in Objective-C, how is this done? Well, when you allocate an object up here, it gets a reference count by default of one, and that means one person cares about it, so to speak. The problem is, though, that as soon as you, um, it's, the problem is, though, that in certain contexts, the operating system might decrement that count. For instance, when a method returns or when that, the pointer to that object effectively goes out of scope so that no one could realistically have access to it anymore, that memory might very well be claimed, reclaimed for you. So how is this done? It's done by this mechanism of reference counting, whereby, again, you allocate an object, it gets a reference count of 1. As soon as that object goes out of scope and you no longer have a pointer to it, the reference count goes down to 0. And as soon as that happens, the operating system can say, oh, I can take back these bytes and reuse them later for something else. But this is problematic, because in iOS, where you have very much event-driven programming, you have fairly short methods being called, so you can't keep objects around by way of pointers on the stack because methods are going to return pretty quickly. So objects, so to speak, will go out of scope. So if you want to keep some object around, like a student object, for the lifetime of your program, or in project two, if you want to keep um, a high scores model around or a gameplay model around, an object thereof in memory throughout the whole lifetime of the program, you need to somehow keep that object in the heap. So how do you do this? You effectively plus one the object. So in the past, literally six plus months ago, you would literally have to plant that stake in the ground yourself. Upon allocating an object, you would typically call retain, which would plus one its reference count further. And there was this other related mechanism called auto release that effectively would plus one it for you and eventually minus one it for you. But in this case, there was also release, so that when you knew your memory, you were done with that memory, you would then yourself manually call it release. So this actually isn't hard. Frankly, it's all about symmetry. If you call alloc, or if you call copy, or if you call retain, the rule of thumb for years was you call release. And it's as simple as that. Well, you can tell these stories quite simply, but in reality, dealing with any kind of memory and pointers, as you may recall from this class or 50, is not easy, right? It's very easy to make mistakes. It's very easy to leak memory. It's very easy to accidentally dereference null. So programmers are not as good at computers at managing memory, as seems to be the case over the years. So this stuff was crossed out with iOS 5, so that the compiler and the runtime on iOS actually figures out when to free memory for you, so you can get out of the business of doing so. We programmers still have some control over, though, how memory is managed. So in what context have we seen assigned strong and weak? In the context of? Yep, and what context specifically in view controllers? Properties. In properties. So recall that properties are nice and magical because they allow you to do two things, one of which we never remember. 
So what are one or two of them? Yeah, Carl. OK, so it allows you to automatically generate setters and getters, thanks to the at synthesize keyword. And what else? OK, good. So dot notation, right? Just the syntactic sugar of dot notation. So we get those two things from actually using properties. But when we generate these getters and setters, we might actually want to influence how they are implemented underneath the hood. So we can specify that the setter actually uses a sign, strong, or weak. Well, what does this really mean? Well, when you say a sign, literally the setter will just do x gets y. It will literally just do a copy of whatever the instance variable in question is. This is great for things like primitives, ints and floats and doubles and chars, where literally you just want to copy. But pointers always get a little more interesting. So in the case of pointers, you typically want to say strong or weak. If you say strong, strong does a plus one. This means I really care about this instance variable, so whatever the pointer actually is. And strong means make sure that even if other parts of my program don't need this pointer anymore, I, whoever is implementing the class, the property in question, do care about it. So make sure that I plant that stake in the ground and plus one it. Weak means, yeah, it'd be nice to have this pointer around, but it's not a huge deal if someone else frees it because it's not owned by me. And so indeed, the rule of thumb is this. If you are going to be using the property to point at some object that you have allocated in code, it should almost always be a strong property. Because clearly, if you allocated the object, you probably want to keep it around. If, by contrast, you are implementing a property that points to an object that someone else allocated in some other class or in Interface Builder, in a nib file, then it's probably fine to make it weak. So in other words, things like IB outlets that allow you to link your code to a nib file even though the nib is yours, the nib is what's responsible for allocating the text view and the button and all of the uh, UI stuff. So those objects are not owned by you per se, so a weak property suffices. So that rule of thumb should pretty much get you through almost all scenarios now. Carl. So like now we never use this Almost always. You should never use release anymore. In fact, Xcode will yell at you in red if you call release or try to call release. And something called ARC, automatic reference counting, is actually enabled for that project. Um, you can get away with calling retain, though it should not be necessary. And indeed, you should just get out of this habit now or pretend you never even heard of these things. And we mentioned them today because, again, we're we've seen them on the help boards and whatnot because people are understandably copying and pasting sample code from online and tutorials and just realize it's, it's dated. So auto-release you can actually use. So we've actually seen auto-release in a couple, in one place consistently. Where is that? Yeah. Sorry? It actually in main. So not in the app delegate, but in main. So if I go ahead and open up, let me open up SQLite again, just as representative of this. Recall that in main, there's this auto release pool that kind of wraps everything the application does. So auto release pools have been traditionally helpful for methods whereby you yourself did not call alloc but instead you call the convenience method. So per Zach's question earlier, you can allocate a string with literally saying ns string alloc in it. And as of a year ago, you, the programmer, would have eventually had to pass in the, retain, uh, the release message because you need to undo the effects of alloc. Alloc gives you plus one, release gives you minus one. So as of a year ago, you would have to have that release call in there. So auto release, though, is a feature of Objective C that allows you to have convenience methods like ns string, string with format. Clearly, that method is allocating memory. Otherwise, where would you put the string that you're creating dynamically on the fly with various printf style placeholders? But if you're not explicitly calling alloc, the rule of thumb was you better not call release yourself. So rather, there's this notion of an auto release pool whereby you can tell the operating system, you know what, this eventually needs to be reclaimed. But I'm not sure when. So allocate this memory not just from the generic heap, but from something called the auto release pool. And I, am, uh, I promise in return for this wonderful flexibility of not having to call retain or release myself, that as soon as that re auto release pool is drained, so to speak, then you can take this object away. Now, pool is just a collection of memory. Draining it means freeing all of it at once. So what's the implication of having this in main? That your pool is filled with a free memory, so filled with water, filled with memory at the very start of your program, but it's apparently not drained until when? Infer from the curly braces. 
It's exactly, until UI application main is done, at which point, game over. The program is clearly done executing because main is the thing that starts and ends the program. So this almost seems useless. So for the more um, sort of sophisticated programmers, if you actually have like a for loop in your code or a while loop that has to allocate, allocate, allocate memory again and again and again, so a tight loop, so to speak, where you're just accumulating a ridiculous amount of memory on the heap that you actually don't want to un unintentionally leave around in RAM until the very end of your program, you yourself can actually write at auto release pool with some curly braces inside of your own for loop so that as soon as your tight for loop is done doing whatever memory management it wants, then that memory is immediately freed. So it allows you, the programmer, more fine grained control over when memory is freed and how much clutter is building up in RAM. So the upside here, if any of this is a little abstract, is that for the most part, you don't have to worry about this anymore. But understanding reference counting and this plus one, minus one, and this idea of keeping objects around by explicitly planting these stakes in the ground, these days with the keyword strong, um, is a nicer version than what you probably keep seeing in books and online references. So in short, don't do what's crossed out. Do do assign strong and weak for all of your code, as by checking the arc box when you start a project. All right, any questions? All right, so this is one of these lessons that literally not until like past recent time have I actually gotten to the habit of writing tests for my code. And this was mostly because no one ever made me do this. Um, but thankfully, there's now a course called CS164 that will make you do this. Um, what are unit tests, so far as you know, if you do? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that uh, if there are any errors, like you don't have to manually like input values to things to make sure it works. Perfect. And it should count like nulls or like make sure that the values are what you expect. Okay, perfect. So they are small methods or functions that you yourself write that simply test other functions or methods that you yourself have written. Right? If you think to yourself, think back to even something like CS50 or whatever first CS course you took, and you finished that problem set, and you got the number of Skittles or pennies right, or Mario, or whatever your first problem set actually was, and you felt so damn gratified at like 2 AM, the thing works. But how did you know it works? How did you know it was correct? What gave you the confidence to actually submit that, thinking you were done with the PSET? Like in real terms, like how did you know it was time to submit besides the fact that the deadline was two minutes later? <laughs> how did you know your code was done? You could see Mario okay, so you could see Mario moving. In the case of Scratch, you could actually see some visual results. And how about in C, when we finally moved away from the GUI? How did you know that some C-based application or Java, whatever your first language was, was right? Yeah. OK, good. So it matched the sample output. So this is actually a reasonable testing mechanism, especially if your whole program is written in main. Um, and main simply has functions like printf that print out to the screen. You can certainly correctness test just by comparing output. But once you move into the world of object-oriented programming, and indeed away from main, which pretty much does nothing now except defer all execution to UI application main, something else altogether, you start to have many, many more method invocations inside of these objects. So how do you now begin to test whether this this method is right, and this method is right. You can look at the aggregate output, but you know from most any program you've written, there's always corner cases, right? And if you had a really sharp TF, he or she almost always found the damn corner case that you didn't think of, inputting negative one, or zero, or a billion, or whatever the corner case was, right? Unless you manually test all of those cases yourself, it's hard to be confident that your code is correct. So unit tests are all about writing methods in addition to the ones you care about for functionality's sake, but methods to test those same things. Right? Indeed, if you look at the comments in your methods, or a, if you look at someone's comments in their commented methods, generally the description of the methods will say what the parameters are, what the function or method does, and then what the output is supposed to be. So we might have a method, and let me just pull up something random, like uh, pull up a text editor here. And we can have, uh, let's say, an instance method that returns an int called add x and y. And this returns sum of x and y. All right, so this is a method I wrote in some class. What would it mean to actually test this method? 
So then let me go ahead and in pseudocode here write a test method. So this is going to be something that returns void that's called test add and it doesn't take any arguments but in here I need to test add okay stupid looking method name I realize but test add and all right so how do I go about testing this method and assume now that these things are in separate classes so what would you do to test this method what does it mean to test the addition method yeah Zach OK, perfect. So we essentially want to test test whether, let's say, add and returns 3 for 1 plus 2. Right? Test with specific values and then check the return value. So how might we express something like this? Well, we could t do something like uh, assert uh, is equals, and this is, again, pseudocode, that x, uh, add colon, well, let's say object. So whatever my object is, let's pass in add 1 and 2, comma, uh, let's say 3. So this statement here is actually common to a lot of languages, this notion of asserting, whereby the goal of an assert statement in general is kill the program here if this line of code does not evaluate to true. So the pseudocode function here is called assert is equals. I'm passing in two arguments. First, I'm passing in the return value of the add and message being sent to some object. And I'm hopefully going to get back what value? obviously. I'm hopefully going to get back three. So the second argument is the value I actually get back. So in what sense is this a unit test? Well, one, it's a method that's testing another one of my methods, but it's doing it on a very small scale so that I can very easily see is this method behaving correctly. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and start enumerating thousands and thousands of examples. So these are not uh, proofs of correctness, as you might discuss in CS121 or CS124, because rather than we would have to try checking either proof this thing by induction somehow, or we'd have to test all possible inputs to this function, which probably isn't the best use of time. So with unit tests, testing things like the corner cases, like 1 and 2 is kind of reasonable. But you know what could be an interesting one? How about negative 1 and 1 had better equal 0? And then another one could be something, again, unexpected, like what if I do 0 and 0? That better be 0. So all those corner cases that verbally for years you've been encouraged, like think about this, think about this, you can literally check those those things by writing these tests. And what happens is then with your compiler or whatever IDE you're using, there's usually a command you can run or a button you can click that will run all of your tests automatically for you, allocating your objects as needed, and then it will tell you which of your various assertions failed. And the upside here is that as soon as all of your assertions pass and you get no red warning output on the screen, you know my code is correct, at least so far as my tests are concerned. So if you've ever wondered what your TF might be doing behind the scenes, he or she is probably running the equivalent of unit tests because he or she hopefully is not manually testing and writing programs manually to test all the submissions of 15 plus students. Rather, we write things that are much more automated than that. So with unit tests, you yourself can do this so that frankly, the next time you change your code at like 1 AM and you hit save and then you submit it thinking, oh, that's all fine, right? you actually have a sanity check that you yourself wrote that can say yay or nay, you just broke all of your code. And better yet, now that you're working with a partner, right, you have this contract right now based on trust that he or she is not going to go and screw over your entire project by introducing some bug. This way, you can actually validate that his or her code is correct, or at least correct so far as the tests are concerned. So there's this other buzzword in this world of testing called regression test or regression testing. What is a regression in the context of software development? Yeah? Something that worked before but never regressed. Perfect. Something that worked before but no longer works. Like you have regressed in the literal sense to some earlier, poorer form of the code. So a regression test is typically a test like this one, test add, that you yourself would write when you realize, damn, we just introduced a bug. Let me make sure I never again make that same mistake. So you introduce a test to test the input and output of some method so that if you do ever break it again, you can detect it and you can fix it before you actually push your code out to some production server or some actual device. So unit testing, and I, I honestly am quite happy to admit, I didn't do this for years because it always seemed like bureaucratic headache and nonsense and all of this. But the reality is even I am now in the habit of writing tests for my code as I write my actual code in parallel. There's a mental model that some people have where test, uh, test first, uh, uh, 
test-driven development, where you actually write the tests first for all of the methods you promise to implement, for instance, in your design documents, and then you write the code, because then you have instantaneous answers as to whether or not your code is correct. And again, uh, an astute person will realize there's this uh, infinite recursion potential where what if your tests aren't correct. So generally, you don't write tests for the tests, but you write the tests in a sufficiently succinct way that there really is little, if any, room for error in your own tests. And you typically use a framework, like we'll introduce after the break, that you can should hopefully be able to assume, since it was written by Apple, it's used by millions of people, so at least it's gotten lots of eyes on it itself is correct. And probably the weak link is going to be your code, not the rest of the world. So why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break here, and then we'll start actually writing some of these on the fly. So before we dive into some actual test writing, a quick uh, review question that I waved my hand at and then forgot to come back to before. So this was the SQLite example. This was the viewcontroller.m file. Why did I have my property here declared in the M file as opposed to the header file, which is where we started putting properties a couple weeks back? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want some notion of privacy whereby you, the view controller class, are really the only one who cares about this property, and you've declared it so that you get the uh, dot notation and so that you get the automatically synthesized getter and setter, but you really have no need to advertise it to anyone else who actually interfaces with this code, even though admittedly there is no one else in question in this small example, you can create effectively a private property by simply declaring it inside of this thing called a class extension. What's a class extension? Well, again, it's just the use of a category that has no name. What's a category? It's kind of a cyclical story here. What does a category allow you to do in Objective-C? We've not really had to use these ourselves. It allows you to extend a class, an existing class. So if you want to add functionality to the NS string class that Apple didn't think to implement, you can do that by redeclaring the NS string interface, but having your own category by in parentheses having a name like foo, which represents your addition to that. Those of you comfortable with JavaScript might know that you can do the same in JavaScript by extending a object's prototype, the dot prototype property. Yeah. Ah, good question. So if you have multiple view controllers, maybe like in project two, um, will you be able to have them talk to one another? So it, short answer is it depends. And at least in the context of project two, which I'll presumptuously assume is of most interest, um, you have flip side and main view controller. And those two don't really talk to one another directly. Rather, they talk to one another by way of delegation. So recall that the flip side controller gets in a pointer called the delegate to the main side controller. So if your main side controller has these properties declared and the flip side controller has a pointer there too, uh, to a view, main view controller object, you can certainly invoke properties in that way. So in short, it depends on who you want talking to whom. And frankly, for the limited scope of the project, it's not a bad thing to practice what we originally preach, which is putting properties in header files and not getting into this additional degree of sophistication. But for those of you who really do kind of want to think about like what are, ev what are every possible design decisions I can make and maybe should make, realize that this is one of the options. All right. All right. So think back to this example here. This is from a couple weeks ago. And this was one of the very first apps we wrote that did a little something more interesting than just printing to NS log. And it was an ATM whereby I can punch in some numbers and pretend to make various deposits. And recall this was our first discussion of uh, Interface Builder where we dragged and dropped the blue lines to create IB outlets and IB action linkages between code and the UI. So what kinds of things might I want to test in this application? What kinds of things might go wrong? You submit this as your homework assignment. What might your TF say, mm mm, doesn't work right? Maybe you tagged it uh, wrongly. Okay, so maybe you tagged it wrong. So pressing 9 actually displays 3 or something like that. That's reasonable, right? Does pressing 9 display 9? That's a reasonable question and a reasonable something you'd want to test. What else? Yeah. OK, good. So if you deposit 50 bucks plus 100 bucks, do you actually have 150 in the balance at the bottom of the screen? So that's a reasonable question to ask. So does your deposit method work? Right, what else might go wrong? 
Yeah. Okay, good. So once you start doing multiple key presses, like one, five, zero, are you actually doing that multiplying by 10 thing we talked about, the sort of grade school math to actually change what's actually in the label up top so that you actually do deposit 150? So in short, something could go wrong in most any one of the methods that we implemented in this program. Now, what were those methods? Well, let's just take a quick tour back. Here's the app delegate, which is a good place to start the story. And there's really nothing of interest here. This is mostly boiler, this is all boilerplate code that I simply cleaned up with some comments. So if I then turn my attention to init with nib name and the view controller in the .m file, well, let's see what's actually in here. I didn't actually override that because it wasn't necessary because all the initialization comes from the nib itself. So what methods did I have? Well, I had a method called clear, which is what gets invoked when the user hits the clear button, assuming my IB outlets were wired, uh, my IB actions were wired correctly. Deposit, which is called when I push deposit. Digit, which is called when I press any one of the 10 digits. Show, which was a little helper method that I wrote. Should auto rotate to interface orientation, which gets called when I rotate the device. View did load, and so forth. So what are the best candidates for testing here? Um, you know, probably Apple's should auto rotate method is probably correct, assuming if I'm just returning true or false. But really, the interesting question is do the methods that I wrote that other people are going to call correct? Right? It's, it's, one, it's because if those things are incorrect, maybe your problems are in those methods themselves or maybe in some of your helper routines. So a very common approach is, you can, is to have unit tests specifically for your public API. That is methods that something else is going to call. And in the case here where I actually have a little helper method called show, I could write a test for that and make sure it does actually show what I expect. But really, at the end of the day, especially for large software projects with multiple people, you care about about testing especially your public facing API because that after all is what's going to break first when other people start using your code. So how do we go about testing this stuff? And actually what else is there? Well recall that there's also this model. So also related to project two where you're tasked with creating models for high scores and for your gameplay. Well here's a very simple model whereby I represented the notion of a bank account with really something super simple. A property called balance that's just a long, long int, an unsigned long, long int. And it was implemented only with one helper method called init, which initializes the balance to zero. So the upside is very easy to test that. Make sure that the balance is indeed zero when I create this thing. Downside is the whole account doesn't really do much, but that's fine, less to test. All right, so how do we go about creating some unit tests? Well. A couple of ways. When you first create an Xcode project, suppose it's a utility application, and I click Next. Besides typing in something like Hangman at the top, you can check off at the bottom, uh, use automatic reference counting, which you absolutely should per the spec, and you can also check Include Unit Test, which is going to give me some boilerplate code for actually bootstrapping this process. If you and your partner did not do that, that's fine. You can still retroactively add unit tests to your code. Um, realize that the quick tutorial for doing so is at this URL here, which is on today's slide. So you can read the various documentation there. Um, if I go ahead and click Next, in the case of Hangman here, click Create. What I'll get on the left-hand side, as you yourselves might have already noticed, is not just the typical boilerplate, but you also get this directory here called Hangman Tests. So Xcode, Xcode supports two types of tests, what they call application tests and what they call logic tests. Application tests are meant to test, among other things, your application's user interface or anything involving interaction, anything that would actually require that the simulator itself be fired up. Um, logic tests typically test your models. So per the spec for project two, you're officially only expected to write unit tests for your model classes, so that you're really just testing some of your low-level logic. And we'll look at both examples here, but you'll see that it's actually pretty easy even to test effectively the UI by simulating key presses and such by manually invoking various IB actions, or specifically by calling the methods that should get called when you touch a button. And yet other frameworks exist for actually trying to test um, the um, even more of the user interface. So we'll see two of these approaches here. So realize that when you check that box, when the, when the template is first, uh, when you're first prompted with the template, you get these things called application tests by default. So this is stuff generally evolving your IB outlets and actions and such. If, however, I go to the file menu and do new and then target, 
I can actually add some additional unit tests for this. Uh, what is a target? So this is not something, actually, if you think back to make files, um, if you did take 50, recall that for many projects, you didn't have a make file. But when we finally introduced make files, we sometimes had multiple targets. Uh, the one piece set where you had, we had, multi, we had a couple piece sets where you would, I'm trying to remember, make generate to generate the pseudo random number generator C program, and then make find, I think was the piece set, even I don't really remember. Um, but we had a make file that had two targets inside of it. And anytime we gave you a make file, we also had a third target or a second target called clean. So anytime you typed make clean, what that was doing was looking in the make file and executing specific commands to do the notion of cleaning. So Xcode has the same idea of targets. You don't see a make file, you don't see it at the command line. Instead, you see a little drop down. And they're generally called schemes here. Um, if we go up here to the top, almost always this thing only has the defaults. So I, if I check here, click here, I see Hangman, which is my one target. And then I can choose the actual device to simulate things on. But you can create other such targets so that you can run different commands on your code. Uh, in this case, tests. So let me go up to New, Targets. Let me, under iOS, choose Other. And then here, Coco Touch Unit Testing Bundle and then click OK. I'll go ahead and name it in the following way. The convention um, that's generally recommended by Apple is to use the name of the application, which in this case would be Hangman, then say Logic Tests or Hangman Application Tests, plural. I'll definitely use Automatic Reference Counting still. And now I'll click Finish. And that's it. I just provide a name. And now notice on the left-hand side, I see a couple of things. One, I now have a new folder called Hangman Logic Tests. And down below that, I have an H file and an M file. Over here on the right, notice that I do indeed have new targets. I have my Hangman target, which represents my application. And I have my Hangman logic test, which represents the thing I just created. And this thing represents the result of my having checked the box when I first chose this template that said use add unit tests or whatever the text was. And now if I look under here, notice that I have two different schemes. Um, this is slightly. Uh, confusing in that we don't see hangman tests under there, and that's just because how the template is configured. It doesn't give you a distinct scheme up there, so just FYI. So what do I then see? Well, if I look in the H file and the M file, I see this here in the H file, so that's great. There's not all that much to learn, but the framework that I promised existed in most languages, in this case is called SendTest. Uh, which is a framework that Apple adopted some years ago to actually make things easier. If you're familiar with C unit, J unit, C++ unit, almost all of these frameworks, except for this one, are something unit, where the something is the language's name. And then here in the M file are a bunch of sample methods that we might want to write. So here's how a unit test works in Objective-C and in many languages frameworks. One, there's a method generally called setup that allows you, the programmer, to do any kind of initialization that has to happen, allocating objects that you want to test, loading a database that, from which you need data, anything like that. And the teardown method does the opposite, freeze memory if you need to in whatever language you're using, closes database connections, that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, you can write as many other methods as you want, so long as they start with the word test in lowercase, T-E-S-T, -E and then capital something. So test foo, test bar, test baz. Because later, when I click the run button up here, but first click and hold on it, and change it to the test button, as you can see here, what that will do is automatically run not my program per se, but my tests. And one at a time, it will execute setup and then test foo then tear down, then set up, then test bar, then tear down, then set up, then test baz, then tear down. In other words, the, it's a heuristic. Any method that, whose name starts with test will get executed, but right before and right after, set up and tear down will get called. So you can sort of create a pristine state of the world in which to actually run your test. So let's actually now use this in the context of this ATM app, which originally had no tests. I did not check the box two weeks ago when we first created this. So I want to go in and start adding some unit tests. And let me go ahead and follow that same sequence of options. I'll go to File, New, Target. And then I'm going to choose Other, and then Cocoa Touch testing unit, uh, unit Testing Framework. Then I'm going to call this ATM Logic Tests, and then Finish. And now I get this folder over here of the code I just described. So in terms of the logic tests, you typically here want to test things like your models. So how do I, what is the model in question for the ATM application? Just to make sure everyone's on the same page. 
So the account. So how do I test the account object's correctness? Well, there's really nothing in the h file other than this property. And in the m file, there's this init method. So really, it would be nice to test one or both of those somehow. And what does it mean to test a property? Well, the property, because of at synthesize, really represents two methods, the getter and the setter. Now here, too, it's probably pretty safe to assume that Apple is synthesizing correct getters and setters. So the init method is probably the one I should be suspicious about, because I wrote that. And I'm more likely to be wrong. Um, when it comes to uh, the code that's been written. So how do we go about doing this? Well, let me go into my ATM logic test.m and I might need to do some setup here. So if I actually want to do some setup, I could do something like this. Give me a pointer called account and give me an account object alloc and then call init on it. Um, but I'm going to have to do a couple of things here. This has given me in my setup method an account object and a pointer there too. But my next method, let's call it down here. So notice this is called test example and literally is meant to be example. Let's change that to test init. And let me go ahead and delete the sample code that's there. How do I go about testing my init method? Well, if my init method is correct, what should be true? Yeah, so my account.balance should be zero. So, and actually, let's be even more explicit here. I really want to test the balance of this account. So hopefully the thing is zero. But how do I access the account now? This is actually not right. I want to say something like if account.balance equals equals zero, I want to do success. Else I want to do failure. And we'll fix all this indentation. So how do I, this is wrong. Why? OK, so good. So there is going to be some kind of assert method. But there's something just fundamentally broken about my code here, even though Xcode isn't yelling at me just yet. Yeah? Exactly. So this is like CS 101 style stuff where I had created a local variable in the setup method and that's not good enough because it's going to now go out of scope and I have no access to this thing. So what's the solution here? What's that? So I could pass in the pointer, but be careful. The whole goal of the testing framework is that each method is going to be called in isolation. So setup should not call my test methods. They'll be called automatically. Yeah, so I can make it a property or at least a um, at least I could make it a um, instance variable. So how can I do this? Well, I'll do it sort of the fancy, well, arguably well-designed way where I'm going to create an interface called the exact same thing, ATM logic tests, and it's a nameless category. And then I'm going to put n down here. And then in here I can do property. Uh, let's come back to the parenthetical in a moment. And I want a property that's a pointer to an account. And then down in here I want to do synthesize account and back it with an instance variable called account. All right, now what should go in the parentheses here for this property? What three keywords are appropriate? What's that? OK, strong, why? Good, I am going to allocate this as I do down here. So I should keep the pointer around with strong. What else? OK, so read. Got to pick one, read only or read write? So read write, otherwise I won't be able to set it at all. And what's the other one? Yeah, so non-atomic, which just means I'm not doing anything multi-threaded. So those are the three. There are defaults. Technically, we don't need read write, um, but this this will do for now. All right. So this is some kind of private property for now. Could also go in our header file per the chat earlier. But now I just have to change this to be what? Self.account. Exactly. All right, so now this is good. Now my setup method is actually going to create this object in memory, call alloc and call init. So now my test balance should hopefully be able to test this method. So what's the actual routine here? Well, in test balance, I can go in here and I can use one of these assert methods, which in Objective C is called ST, it's always something ST, assert true in this case. And just to give you a sense, Notice you have a whole bunch. Assert that it's nil, assert that it's not nil, assert that it throws, something called an exception, uh, assert true, assert false, assert equals, assert equals, uh, assert equal objects. So in short, there's a whole bunch of assert methods that you can do. So I'll choose one of the simpler and most useful ones, assert true. And I want to assert that the account balance equals equals zero. And if it doesn't, 
I want a little comment to display on the debugger window, balance is not zero. So the syntax is a little different from my pseudocode earlier, but the st assert true literally is supposed to uh, kill my program if the assertion that self.account.balance equals equals zero is not true. And if it isn't true, what's going to happen is that string is going to get printed to the screen as a reminder to myself as to what this test actually was. So that's about all I can test in this particular example. And when I actually run this code, it will hopefully fail or not fail on me. Let me go ahead and switch to, let me just open one that also has some application tests ready for us. Actually, no, that's OK. We'll do this here. All right, so if I actually run this thing via test, first choosing ATM logic tests, now clicking test, whole bunch of things is going to fail here because I wasn't paying very close attention here. So we need to do a couple things like a port account.h, property with retain or strong, there we go. Build failed, what I do wrong now. OK, so let me do this. This actually cost me an hour of my life last night. Um, so hopefully it won't cost you yours. So Xcode is not the most perfect tool in the world. Um, and especially when you start doing more sophisticated things like version control and also in this case uh, unit testing, which should not be a huge leap, things start to break. Um, and Stack Overflow will be your friend to the, for this. So this is the error that I'm actually getting here. Um, it has to do with the linker, which is the process and compilation whereby you take bits that you wrote and bits that someone else wrote, mash them together to actually have one final executable binary. Um, in this case, I'm getting two errors here related something to, it looks like my class. It's kind of cryptically named because you typically get these somewhat random symbol names being generated from code that you write, but it clearly has to do with what? So it has to do something with account. It can't find my account code, even though I've imported the file and I, it's right there. I mean, it's literally in the same project. So frankly, some Googling led me to this resolution here. If you click on ATM at the top, which generally brings up all of the various esoteric properties, click on build phases. And then under build phases, you'll see compile sources here. And this is actually here now. Why? Oh, OK. So notice, this now I have my ATM target selected, which is the default. Before we ever started talking about unit tests, that thing was always there. If I choose ATM logic tests, notice what's missing. So account.m. So if I actually click the plus and then choose account.m, thereby adding a mention of the object code that I need to be included in this thing, thank god, this time it worked, test succeeded, and the fact that nothing happened is a good thing, right? That means literally test succeeded. So let's actually screw something up. Let me go into my logic test, and let me just assume that, you know what, my balance had better be $100 by default, even though that's definitely not to be the case. Let me go ahead and open up the debugger window in the bottom, just so we have something to look at. And now let me go ahead and click test. And again, notice we're not using run, we're using test. And in this case, build succeeded. Oh, test failed. And what actually failed? Well, notice here, if I click on the red at top left, self account balance equals equals zero should be equals equals 100 should be true, but it's not. So what this means is that the compilation and execution of your program will literally be halted. You can't actually run it in the simulator because it's wrong. So the upside here is that you now know that you either just screwed something up or when you just did a pull from your partner from Bitbucket, you know that he or she actually screwed something up, at which point then you'll be pissed because uh, then they have to go fix it or you have to figure out what's broken. But the upside is now that you know um, and you can now um, uh, you can now have quantitative measures of just how correct or incorrect your code is. Now, what about the actual view controller code? There's a ridiculous amount of functionality we wrote to actually handle digits and deposits and clearing and whatnot. So again, let me do this. File, new, target. And I'm doing this again because I did not check that box initially two weeks ago to create unit tests. I'm going to call these ATM application tests and then click finish. And now I get another folder down here, ATM application tests, just like before. If I click on the project itself, notice I now have three targets. And here, too, let me teach you something that took me an hour. Um, when you create, again, uh, add unit tests to your project by way of the file menu that I just did, you get, again, these things called logic tests that will not spawn the simulator to actually run and run your code in an environment where you can test things about the UI. So you actually have to follow steps at that URL. Um, which will allow you to change the default setting of logic tests 
to something called application tests. And it really is more arcane than you, it should be. You have to copy and paste like an environment variable into a certain part of the compiler, into Xcode's UI. It's just a pain in the neck. So if you check that box when starting project two, like the spec told you to, you don't have to worry about that because you have application tests and adding unit tests, sorry, logic tests is easy. But FYI, all your answers to all the problems I ran into are at this URL and Stack Overflow and this lecture. All right, so how do we go about testing these kinds of things? Well, let's go ahead now into the uh, ATM application tests file, which currently is empty. And let me start sketching out a couple of things that we might actually want to test. So we again have a setup method and a teardown method and a test example. And indeed, if I try running the test suite now with ATM application tests. So again, remember to change your target here. Let me run tests. Build succeeded, test failed. Why? Well, what does ST fail do? It will always fail, right? This is there because hopefully you'll never get to this point in your code. The fact that I have means something's broken. Well, what's broken? Well, that's just because the template code they give me is meant to die, just to draw your attention to the fact that you need to actually write unit tests. And as an aside, in case you're thinking this is kind of stupid that to test your code, you have to constantly change among these targets, realize that via this interface here, build phases and such, you can actually set up dependencies so that when you actually run your normal program, it will automatically run the tests for you and just won't run in the simulator until your tests pass. So it doesn't have to be as tediously manual with all the clicking that I'm doing here. All right, so back to the application, ATM application tests. What kinds of things might we want to test here? Well, a very common paradigm is to name your test methods after the methods that you're actually testing. So let's do an easy one. Let's go ahead and test the app delegate, which should hopefully be set up for me. So hopefully that will be an easy one to do. Uh, let me go ahead and set up the framework for testing my clear method. So test clear. And notice these always return void and they never take arguments. That's just what the framework dictates. And then we'll do another one like void test deposit. And there's a couple others we could probably do. But these are all placeholders now for actual code. So how do I now get access to effectively my UI? Well, let me go into my setup method. As before, anytime you override a parent class's method, you should always call it via super. And in this case, what I'm going to do is this. I want to have around a pointer to all the interesting things that run a program. The app delegate pointer would be nice. What else is a big object that has to do with running apps? The view controller. And then the view controller has a view, a UI view, which is literally all the WYSIWYG things that I dragged and dropped into the UI, all the buttons and whatnot. I'd love to have the big rectangle that encompasses them all. So let me go up here and just have some properties declared so I can do that. I'm going to do it the fancy semi-private way. So interface, ATM, application tests, nameless in, uh, class extension. Let me go in here and do a property. And the first property will be called app delegate app delegate. And then the next one will be uh, view controller, star view controller. And you can call these things anything you want, but frankly, you'll stay more sane if you just use the camel case notation like this so that they're consistently named. And then I'll want a pointer to a UI view. And then for each of these, let me go ahead and do non-atomic for all of them, uh, which we keep doing. Uh, let me go ahead and do read write for all of them, even though that's the default. And then lastly, we have to answer the question of pointers. Should these be strong or weak? Someone say weak. Weak is correct. So why? Well, again, I, I being the class in which I'm typing right now, I am not going to allocate an app delegate. I'm not going to allocate a view controller. That's going to be done by the application itself. So in this case, I do not need to allocate those objects. Indeed, I will not call alloc. So we'll see how I get these pointers in actuality. So now let's actually do quick synthesis of these. So a little tedious to type, but we'll just do app delegate is going to be backed by underscore app delegate. Synthesize view controller is going to be uh, backed by underscore view controller. And then lastly, view is going to be backed by underscore view. And then up here, to make Xcode stop complaining, I'm going to have to go ahead and include my app delegate class. I'm going to have to go ahead and include my view controller class. And then that's it. So I don't need to worry about UI view because I'm going to get that from um, some of the template code itself. All right. So in my setup code, how do I get access to these three important big objects? Well, I want to assign self.appdelegate to the result of calling UI application shared application delegate. 
So this method call returns effectively a pointer to the UI application that was created by main, if you think back to where the story always begins, and delegate returns a pointer to what? The app delegate. To whom UI application main, according to our story, delegated control. So this gives me a pointer to my own app's app delegate. How do I get access to the view controller? Well, self.viewcontroller is going to get the return value of self.appdelegate.viewcontroller. So why does this work? Well, recall the code that we keep taking for granted in appdelegate.m. In appdelegate.m, notice what it's doing. It's, yes, allocating the view controller, calling init with nib name, but where is it putting the return value? Well, there it is. Once I have a pointer to the app delegate, I can get a pointer to the view controller. So lastly, all we need is the sort of generic view that encompasses everything. So self.view, and this one's actually pretty easy. Self.view gets self. Dot view controller dot take a guess view now we have all three sort of macroscopic objects that are really interesting when it comes to my app's overall execution and its overall uh, UI so how do we test the app delegate well this one's pretty easy and frankly it's probably not necessary to get into this habit but let's just do it for good measure st assert uh, st assert uh, not nil and then pass in what self dot app delegate and then comma cannot find the application delegate or some such string. So this will be a little sanity check to assert that indeed the app delegate exists. So let's do something more interesting now. How do I go about testing the clear method that it actually works? Well, on a high level, how would you go about testing the notion of does your clear button work? What would you do in, in the real world? Yeah. OK, good. You call it, and then you see, or you press it in the real world, and see if it actually clears the screen and resets whatever's on the screen to something like 0. So let's go ahead and try this. We need to simulate this now. So let me go ahead and do self.viewcontroller, and I'm going to call the digit method, because I need to put something on the screen in order to actually have something to clear. So I'm going to pass in digit. What does digit accept as an argument? Here's the method in view controller. What does digit expect? Yeah, UI button. So recall that ID is sort of a generic pointer. Sender is the generic name given to the things that send IB action messages. So if I actually want to simulate a button, I could allocate a button, but that feels a little messy. Well, I can actually talk to my UI. I can say self.view, and then I can say, uh, uh, let's see, yep, view with tag. And then I can say, well, give me, let's pick a number, one. In other words, let's go ahead and type 1. Or let's be more specific, simulate typing just the number 1. So recall that we tagged everything in Interface Builder. What did this mean? Well, let me go back to the nib file. Let me click on the 1. Let me open all the inspectors on the right. Let me click the attributes inspector. And then remember, like three, two or three weeks ago, I went down here and then said that I need a programmatic way of uniquely identifying each of the numeric buttons that's not just their string label. Well, there I had one. So what does this do over here? If I go back into application tests, this method here, view with tag, will literally return to me a pointer to what type of object? Sanity check. A UI button, which descends from a class called UI view. So a button is indeed a view. So what did I do? I literally just simulated typing the number one. So if I did this correctly, let's go ahead and do this. ST assert and true. And now I want to go ahead and insert, assert that self.viewcontroller.deposit label, his text is actually is equal to string quote unquote dollar sign one. And if not, I'm going to go ahead and print something like uh, deposit should be $1. So in other words, I want to assert that it's the case that the text of the deposit label property is equal to the string, quote unquote, dollar sign one. And here, little uh, check, why don't I not just use equals equals? 
it would test the two MS strings point to the same or are the same pointer. Perfect. Right? So you don't want to compare the pointers, you want to compare the actual string values, which is string e is equal to string. We'll actually care, compare them char by char. Now if I go ahead and click on the error here, expected identifier. Oh, where am I missing? Okay, there we go. I had an extra square bracket. Okay, so what did I do? One, I simulated touching the number one, and then two, I'm checking in the UI, does what's appearing in the label right now actually match what I, as a human, expect should appear in the label? And notice that I'm using my same IB outlet called deposit label. What is that thing? Well, again, a quick refresher. If I go to my H file, recall that we had these properties a couple weeks ago, a pointer to an account, a pointer to the UI label, a pointer to the deposit, and then if I look in the nib file, and actually right click on this, I see that deposit label is indeed a blue line that I dragged and dropped over to files owner, the view controller class. So in application tests, the goal was to test the clear method. How do I test the clear method now? So clearing should yield zero dollars. So let's go ahead and test this. So self dot, whoops, so do self dot view controller. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it the clear message. And what do I pass it as an object? Well, to be honest, it actually doesn't matter in this case, right? Because anytime I press the clear button, it's only wired to one method. So if I look over at the clear method, which is over here, notice, am I even using the sender argument? No, so I can kind of cut a corner here because it doesn't matter. And I can simply pass in nil and not have to worry about tagging also the clear button. It's just not necessary. So what do I want to check for after I've simulated hitting clear? ST assert true what? What should be what? OK, I'll keep playing. So deposit label text is equal to string. Come on, 0. All right, so that's it. So now we have a test in place that when I run this test suite, it's not just going to test my underlying models, which is purely code-based, has nothing to do with UI and interface, but rather here I'm testing really the user's interactions by simulating the key presses, sending the exact same IB actions that would have been passed uh, themselves, and then talking to the IB outlets to making sure that the UI is responding to those actions in the manner that we expect. So let me go ahead and rather than write out a whole bunch of these somewhat tediously, let me go ahead and open up a pre-baked version that has exactly the same code but also some slightly some additional methods just so we can take a quick peek. So this is the same overarching thing. Notice I have three targets up here just as before and in my M file, notice that all of this is the same as we just typed, same as before, same as before. How about deposit? Well, deposit, this is why it was going to get a little tedious to type. Notice the kinds of things I do. So I want to test the deposit button. Note it, recall that test deposit is going to be the first thing executed after setup. So what do I want to do? I want to talk to myself here. Balance should be $0 at first. So I write a comment to that effect. I then try to assert that it is indeed true that the balance label's text is equal to the string, quote unquote, 0. And what's going to happen if this assertion fails? That's it. This method will terminate. I'll get a red message on the screen. My other tests might still run, but I need to fix this before I can proceed to test yet other things here. So now I pretend to deposit $1. How do I do that? Well, just as before, I pass to the view controller the digit message, and I pass in view with tag 1 to effectively simulate pressing the number 1. Then I go ahead and simulate pressing the deposit button, passing in nil, because I don't care about what button hit deposit. There's only one of them, just like the clear button. And then I assert a couple of things. Once I hit deposit, I want to insert, assert that the deposit label is now 0 and the balance label is now 1 because it's been moved from the top of the screen to the bottom of the UI. Then I didn't want to stop there. right? I could still have something wrong whereby maybe the first deposit works but the second one doesn't. So this time let's not only try depositing a second amount but what also have I consciously chosen to deposit here? Not just another dollar but a two digit value, right? These are the kind, this is the opportunity to think about like what could I have screwed up? Did I screw up corner cases like double digit numbers or triple digits? Certainly something more than one. So I'll, let me wave my hands at some of these details, but after I deposit $12, I should hopefully see $13 in the balance. And then I figured this was enough unit tests. Now, if I realize subsequently that, damn, my TF or I found some other bug in the code, writing a regression test would be about going back in here, writing a new test 
that tests some other thing that I wasn't anticipating, and then making sure that that subsequently always passes. What about testing digit? This one's a little more interesting because there's a lot of lot more corner cases to consider. So when I push a digit button like the number zero, what should be the case? Well, by default, the deposit label should be zero dollars. If I input a leading zero. This is a good one to test. So let me go ahead and simulate the digit message with an argument of the zero button. And what should it be at the end? Should still be dollar sign zero, not zero zero or something like that. Then if I input a one, then if I input a two, that should hopefully yield me 12. So in short, this is finally the opportunity whereby we might have always, especially in 50, preached like check, think about corner cases and test zeros and negative ones. You can literally now make those tests yourself so that you know with confidence at least your code is correct with respect to the framework you yourself have written. Yeah? So if we have this test, this test digit, why do we also assert in the other methods that the label is still 12? Good question. So if we have, if we're testing one thing here, why did we seem to be redundantly testing it elsewhere? Um, you don't have to do it that way. And in fact, there's this notion in unit testing called mock objects. And the idea is that you really try to test only the method in question. So I'm kind of being a little lazy here in that I'm testing um, the deposit button as well as the key presses in one place. And a mock object would essentially mean that you actually implement a fake version of the press of the digit method or of the clear method so that you know that its value is just always going to be some sentinel value. But because these are relatively simple programs, and I think in, uh, concept, uh, um, in terms of learning the stuff, I think it's a little easier to just write more intuitive tests. But ultimately, we would not want to, accent, uh, we would not want to test multiple methods in the same test routine generally, if that makes sense. All right, so, and then tear down. I'll, this is commented out. I actually don't need to do any teardown because I haven't done anything interesting. So we can essentially leave it at that. So when I actually choose then my application test and I click run here, not run, click test for this target, notice that it builds, succeeded. Notice that the simulator pops up, immediately quits, but that's good because the test succeeded. And if I actually do something wrong, let's go up to test clear and let's say deposit should be one. Well, let's actually change this to like 1,000, which is definitely wrong. So now let's rerun the tests. The simulator should pop up again after the build succeeds. Ooh, test failed, and I now immediately see which line of code failed some test. And I can now try to hone in on what the mistake actually was. Yeah. They, ah, uh, it's a good question. I believe, it's a good question. I don't know. I suspect there is no guarantee that they will be executed in order because they should all by design be independent. But it will always be set up, method, tear down, set up, method, tear down. Yeah? Once one of the tests fails, will it go to another one at all? Or, or do we, like, if we say we corrected that, do we have to worry that another test might fail after that? Or does that imply that all the other ones are fine? Good question. So in this case, I've just made two mistakes in test clear and test deposit. The assert will kill execution of the code where it fails, but the subsequent methods will still get called. Which is why, again, the upside of your writing unit tests, especially if it feels tedious, the motivation is keep them nice and small so that they're really testing individual things. Other questions? All right, so some words on evil hangman. And so that we have an opportunity to discuss some possible design issues. Um, I'm scrolling down here in the spec dot, 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 to the various features and design constraints. Just to strike up a conversation as you submit or start um, your alpha um, for tomorrow, what kinds of things you want to be thinking about? Um, so ultimately, your application has to do a few things. When it starts up, you have to load the dictionary of words from the plist. And then what needs to happen next? What kind of UI elements do you need on the screen? Okay. What's that? Okay, so a UI, a label for what? For having your um, guesses. Okay, so for, uh, so for the guesses, so I'll just draw that as a rectangle, but assume that the UI, the aesthetics can be whatever you want. So this is some kind of, this is a UI text field. What else do we need on the screen? Do we need the keyboard to be there for input? Okay, so we need some kind of keyboard, so I'll just depict this with some keys like that. What else do we need? A label to display the Yes. So we need a label to display the word. OK, so word and guesses. So let's assume that this is, um, there's two things here. So one is the word that you're trying to guess. So I'm going to draw it 
just as placeholders, but you can do it any way you want. And then maybe we do need another label to show the letters of the alphabet that you've guessed or not guessed, some kind of feedback mechanism. What else might we need? Yeah? How many guesses do you have left? Yeah, so how many guesses do we have left? So we need some kind of label or some kind of UI mechanism. As I showed last week, I chose to use a um, UI progress view just because I thought it looked a little sexier than a number. But you can do whatever you want. But another UI widget here. Anything else? A button to change the settings. A button to change the settings. OK, so if you follow the template of the utility application, could be something over here where this is settings. And that'll flip things around. You can still use the little I in the bottom right hand corner. But if you're using the built in keyboard, it's going to be a little hard to access that. So you should at least move it or change the functionality to be this button. Yeah? Oh, I was going to ask if it was OK just to use the I. Good question. Yep, absolutely. You can just use the I if you want. Yeah? What's that? Yeah, so we need another button to start a new game. And realize I'm a little biased here. I'm essentially drawing my version of this. Um, but you can do this. Any interpretation is fine. All right, so that's pretty good. So some of the design considerations. One came up before class and on the help boards last night. Um, you've got 140,000 words in this dictionary. And one of the constraints in the spec is that the user should be able to choose word lengths between one and the maximum length of the words in the dictionary. So do you, manu do you hard code this? Maximum, N, we call it in the spec. What are the alternative? What are the options here? You can hard code it by skimming through the list or writing a little script that finds the longest word or sorting them uh, by length and then just counting the letters manually and then hard coding that with the sharp define or a const. That's one approach. What's what's an upside of that? It's fast. It's correct. The spec only requires that you support words.plist. So in theory, the dictionary is invariant. But downsides? It could change, right? Like, you know, for the spec, we only require words.plist, but does it feel like the best design to hard code that? And then anytime you update the dictionary with every up to update to your app store, like, just feel, it rubs me the wrong way, right? Feels like we might as well figure this out dynamically so that we're not introducing a potential mistake. Um, and frankly, on a gigahertz whatever device, like, you can search 140,000 words pretty fast and figure out the maximum length. So I would encourage you, from my own design perspective, just figure it out dynamically, probably, unless you find that it's crazy slow. But I don't think you'll find that to be the case. But again, argue it one way or the other in your design document or in comments in your code if you disagree. So what about this, the keyboard? So some people don't really like the built-in keyboard. Why? Yeah, there's all the keys that are still there. Even if you guess the letter, in there, all the numbers are there, all the punctuations there, the space is there, the return key is there. There's just way more than the 26 buttons you actually need. Now, on the upside, what's what's the upside? What's an upside of actually using the built-in keyboard? You don't have to make a keyboard, right? It's a wheel you don't have to reinvent. Uh, downside, though, is that same reason. And unfortunately, you can't override, at least via any public API, the like colorings of the keyboard of individual letters. So you can't sort of do what would be ideal, probably, which is disable some of the buttons or change them aesthetically and hide other numbers and whatnot. You can install a different keyboard altogether. You can have all numbers. You can have email address-centric keyboards and whatnot. But you don't have fine-grained control via the SDK. So what's an alternative? to using the built-in? What's that? Make your own. All right, so that's not that hard, right? You just need, it's a little tedious, but you need 26 buttons probably, or 26 something so that you can detect where the user is actually pressing. So if you have 26 buttons, you probably need 26 IB outlets so that you can talk to each individual button so you know what letter was pressed. So you could have 26 properties, each of which is IB outlet, but here you're starting to cross that line of like reasonable design, right? 26 properties is sort of CS101 style, like let me just have 26 variables. What would we do once we had 26 variables? Collapse them into an array. So now maybe you have an NS array that's a property, but the array can't be an IB outlet. You can't just drag multiple things into an array. Just Xcode won't let you do that. But remember from our no nib example in class a week or two ago, you can programmatically create the uh, effect of those blue lines by adding targets. Uh, you can configure things with code to listen for messages. So that might be one approach. Now, it's a good way, frankly, of dividing work. If you really hate the keyboard, have your partner make a new keyboard while you focus on like the models or something. So one way. All right, so that's one approach. There's no right answers here. So what are some of the other design decisions? Well, when it comes to actually 
implementing good gameplay, so non evil hangman, what needs to happen in verbal pseudocode when the game starts up? Yeah? Uh, gameplay picks a word. OK, gameplay picks a word. You store that in some local or some instance variable or some property, probably, in your good gameplay object. OK, good. So as the user touches numbers on the key or UI buttons that you've manually constructed, you need to start revealing letters or penalizing the user if they've guessed a letter that's not actually there. So good gameplay is actually relatively easy to implement. And I would probably recommend starting with good gameplay. But we have to bear in mind that you also need evil gameplay. So you need to somehow ideally standardize the interface to these good gameplay and these evil gameplay objects. And the spec specifically has you implement a gameplay delegate protocol. So those of you who are quite comfortable with object-oriented programming probably realize you can actually have a parent class and then have both evil and good descend from it. So you could standardize the interface that way. And that's fine. We do prescribe intentionally a protocol just because there's really an, that's kind of been an overused abuse of hierarchy, where there's not really a conceptual hierarchy here. It's just the way in Java, for instance, to actually share functionality. But in Objective-C, you can have these protocols. So if I want to have in my view, main view controller a pointer to the brains of this application, namely a good uh, gameplay delegate, how can we go about declaring this property? In main view controller, I might have at property, something in parentheses. Then I might have, I kind of want either a good game, let's see, what do we call it? It's a good gameplay. Pointer, good, or I could do this. Don't necessarily write this down because this isn't necessarily the best way. Evil gameplay. So I could do this, right? I could have two pointers, one to a good gameplay object, one to an evil gameplay object. And when the user turns evil on or off, I just with an if condition or a switch decide which of these objects to talk to. But what else could I do that's probably a little cleaner? Because this doesn't scale all that well, right? If we introduce a foo method, a foo model, a bar model, and a baz model, it's going to um, you know, it's going to be copy paste. You can ID and then gameplay delegates and go brackets as the type. Yeah, so why don't I try to genericize this so that I just have one pointer, and at any point in the program, it only points to the gameplay type that I'm using. So I'll call this delegate, and it actually has to be a gameplay delegate, although it's not, I can't do this, delegate. I can't do this because this is not a what? It's not a class. So I can't declare it like that. So what I really need to say is I actually want an ID pointer that implements the gameplay delegate protocol. And I'm just going to generically call it delegate. So now if this is the property in my main view controller class, I can, anytime the user clicks the new button or anytime the gameplay starts, I can allocate one of two objects, either one and let me do dot, dot, dot. Either one, I can do self.delegate gets, let's say, good, good gameplay uh, alloc in it. And then I'll do this more literally. If evil is off, one, two, three, four, I can do this. And now I'll go up here, else. Self.delegate gets evil gameplay. So in other words, this way, I can very generically have in memory at, one point, at any given point in time only one pointer to the gameplay object, the model, so to speak. So we're back. And the question at hand is, <laughs> in the words.plist, suppose that there weren't a words of length 4 or 5. But nonetheless, we have a slider that is allowing me to configure the length of the words we want to support. How do we actually blacklist, potentially, these holes in the data set? So one, it's relatively easy to figure out what those holes are. right? You can iterate over all of the words in words.plist and have some kind of array that just uh, or some kind of mechanism that keeps track of. I've seen one letter words, two letter words. It could be just an array of Booleans, frankly. So you can figure that information out pretty easily. But as for the slider, a slider is, if you've played with it yet, it is a floating point value. It has a couple properties, min value, max value, and its actual value. And when you drag and drop it with your finger, you can set it to 0.0, you can set it to 26.0, or something like that. 
So you're going to have to implement this with arithmetic, not with any built-in functionality of the slider. So what I do, for instance, in the staff's implementation, which isn't publicly available, we only played with it a week or two ago, what I do is I keep an array around that keeps track of, well, how many word lengths actually exist. Ideally, it's 26, and then everything's nice and simple. But damn, if it's 25, that means I kind of have to repartition the width. So what I actually do is as you slide the slider and you reach 4.0, 4.0 doesn't necessarily mean words of length 4.0. It means the fourth possible length that I determined to exist when I analyzed the whole array of words in the universe. Now, if this is a bit mind-bending, you don't actually have to deal with this in the spec, because we, we don't expect that you uh, deal with this. But if you want to, it's actually a really good exercise of ensuring that you can plug in an arbitrary words.plist file, and things will not break on you. And if that's a little abstract, let me not elaborate, because it's actually a really interesting like, design opportunity there. But you have to do that mapping yourself of a floating point value to an available spectrum of word lengths. Other design questions or comments? All right, so the best advice, honestly, we can give you is like start tonight. Because it's a lot of fun if you don't have the pressure of like a Monday night or Tuesday night, like Tuesday afternoon looming over you. Um, so why don't we officially adjourn here? I'll stick around for one-on-one -on -one questions. Otherwise, do attend this week's section, and we'll see you next week.